Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you today about two things, vocabulary knowledge and sleep. So the abundance of words that we know is crucial for our, to our ability to function effectively as human beings. So vocabulary knowledge is not only a fundamental component of language, it's also one of the strongest predictors of educational success. What's more, vocabulary knowledge is often impaired in individuals with a variety of developmental disorders like dyslexia, autism, ADHD. So it's crucial that we really understand how it is that the brain develops the capacity to acquire this abundance of knowledge so that we can inform teaching and instruction and allow individuals to reach their potentials. But you were thinking this talk was about sleep and actually vocabulary and sleep are, are fascinatingly interlinked. So over a decade of research tells us that beyond sleep's ability to um, protect our daily functioning, sleep also functions to strengthen memories. Um, for instance, it strengthens memories of newly learned words and allows new words to be integrated into the brain's mental dictionaries. It's important to say that, that sleep plays a role in memory way beyond language as well, so sleep plays an important role in things like strengthening our memory for newly learned spatial locations, um, strengthening memories for emotional events, and also plays a general role in things like revision. So you can tell your teenagers, for instance, that they're better off going to bed at their usual time rather than cramming and staying up late on the night before an exam. So findings such as these have led to um, funding to, for children's sleep lessons in a bid to improve performance. Okay, so here at York we have uh, a sleep lab um, that allows us to study the relationship between sleep and learning and memory directly. So in this uh, two bedroom, soon to be three bedroom sleep lab, we use EEG or electroencephalography to record on the brain activity that occurs during sleep and relate that to how memory changes before and after sleep. And yes, we do pay students to fall asleep um, in our lab. <laughs> so you'll probably be aware that sleep is characterized by a number of different stages. So when you're, when you're awake, when you're alert, you see relatively high frequency beta activity. When you've got your eyes closed and, and, and you're resting, but you're still awake, you see what's called alpha activity. And then as you go progressively through the different stages of sleep, your brain activity decreases in frequency. So you see um, slower activity in stage one sleep as you're nodding off, um, uh, reduced <coughs> muscle movements, reduced eye movements. And then in stage two, the frequency starts to get a little bit slower. And then in st stage three and four, which are often collectively referred to as slow wave sleep or deep sleep, uh, we see these very slow oscillations. And then you'll have probably heard of REM sleep or rapid eye movement <coughs> sleep, or better known as dream sleep, so this is when you dream. There are two key parameters that we're really interested in that have been shown to be important for memory consolidation. And these are these slow oscillations and also sleep spindles, which isn't very clear on this diagram. But sleep spindles are short bursts or short sneezes of, of, of EEG activity that are temporally synchronized with these slow oscillations during deep sleep. So how, how does the brain work? How does the brain promote, um, uh, use sleep to promote memory? So you can think of the brain as of having a dual memory system. This is one view. Um, so we have this short-term store in our hippocampus that is responsible for processing incoming information, new information. Um, and here is where new information is stored in a sparse and rudimentary form. We also have a neocortex, which is responsible for the longer-term storage of information. So it's where um, robust memories are stored in the long term. And one view is that during sleep, Slow oscillations and spindles work to shift information from this short-term store to this longer-term robust store. Um, and this is important because you can imagine if we didn't have this short-term kind of segregation, then you, new information would be at risk of overwriting what's already in there. Okay, so this is why this dual system is thought to be important. And studies by uh, Gareth Gaskell in the psychology department have shown that um, 
when the brain is presented, when you're presented with a new word, your hippocampus lights up, whereas when you are presented with a word you, you've already slept on, that you've learned the previous day, you see activation in the neocortex, in the superior temporal gyrus. Um, so this is further evidence that sleep is really working to shift information from this short-term store to a longer-term stable state. We've also got evidence um, that as you sleep, your ability to respond to words you, you speeds up. So you respond to words that you've slept on faster than you respond to words that you've only just learned. And this speeding up overnight correlates with the amount of time that you spend in this deep sleep, so this slow oscillation activity. Um, and also spindles, which I've mentioned, correlate with the extent to which you embed a new word with existing knowledge. So we tend to train words like dolfeg, made up alien words that sound like a word you already know. So for instance, dolphin. And what we see is that people slow down to their, in their ability to respond to dolphin after sleep. And this is because dolfeg has started to compete with it for recognition. Um, and that's a marker that the, this new word has become a fully fledged <laughs> lexical item. OK, so all of this suggests that sleep is playing a pivotal role in learning and memory, but all of the data that I've presented so far is on adults. So what, what I was really interested in was whether the same applies across development. Now, children are really interesting when it comes to sleep. Um, I know that from personal experience as well. Um, but children have a particular sleep architecture that may leave them optimised for memory consolidation. So, for instance, I told you that adults pass through a number of stages during the night as they go to sleep, and these cycles permeate throughout the night. Children seem to spend particular amounts of time in slow wave sleep, which we know is important for memory consolidation. So there's one clue that children might be at some kind of advantage for, for sleep consolidation. Another clue is that earlier in life, we sleep for longer than we do in later in life, and sleep duration decreases throughout the lifespan. Again, suggesting that sleep may work to promote and protect and enhance the, the abundance of information that has to be acquired earlier in life. So we started to carry out experiments to see whether children really do show these similar sleep effects to adults. And when they're learning new words, is sleep really key? And also, are the effects enhanced? OK, so we train children on new words, um, either in early in the morning or later in the evening. And then we test them immediately after they've learned, 12 hours later, 24 hours later, and one week later. So at the 12-hour point, children who've been trained in the morning have had a day awake. Children who've been trained in the evening have had a night of sleep. So this design allows us to tease apart the effects of time and sleep. And you may be wondering how we managed to test children early in the morning and later in the evening. Um, we, we actually tested children in boarding schools, um, so we, could, we didn't interfere with family routines so much. Um, times got so desperate at one point that I, was, uh, I actually served out dinners, school dinners in, in exchange for participants. <laughs> so these kind of studies are, are quite tricky to run. So 12 hours after learning, you can see that the group that were trained in the evening showed this big boost in performance, whereas the group that were trained in the morning didn't show a change in their ability to remember the new words. The group that were trained in the morning did show an enhanced effect after they'd had their sleep, however. So this suggests that children are showing the same sleep effects as adults. We also have evidence that children seem to show enhanced effects of sleep relative to adults, so they show bigger overnight improvements. And we also see that children who are better consolidators, better at improving their memory during sleep, also have bigger vocabularies. And this suggests to us that sleep's just not, not just playing a role in strengthening memories overnight, but also plays a kind of a more longer term effect of potentially improving vocabulary growth, growth over time. A lot of the data I've talked about already involves training novel, made up, fictitious words like dolphin, which don't exist. But we, we've shown these similar sleep effects in childhood when we train real science words associated with the national curricula, and also when children are learning when they're not realising they're learning, when, when they're listening to stories. Um, so these findings have important implications for sleep being integral to learning, as I said, <coughs> but they also have important implications for children who have developmental disorders. So many developmental disorders are characterised by both sleep difficulties 
and vocabulary difficulties. So for instance, autism is a prominent example and so is dyslexia. And what we wanted to know is whether some of these sleep difficulties might in some way account for the vocabulary learning difficulties that these children display or at least contribute to them. So we carried out a study where we tested children, not in the lab, but in their home environments using portable EEG. So the procedures are the same, but they get to sleep in their own beds. <coughs> and we tested children with dyslexia and children without dyslexia. We trained them on new words and tested them immediately and then after sleep and then one week later. And what we found is that for typical children, they showed improvements over the course of the week, and these improvements correlated with the amount of slow oscillation activity during deep sleep. So the children with more deep sleep showed better improvements over the course of the week. Typical so typical children showed that pattern, but the children with dyslexia didn't show any correlations between sleep and learning. Thank you. Um, so Although children with dyslexia showed improvements over the course of the week, these improvements weren't associated with sleep. So sleep seems to be functioning in a different way in dyslexia as it, to, to how it functions in typical development. And what we think is going on here is that children with dyslexia are not encoding, they're not learning to the same levels as children without dyslexia. So sleep can't work to function in the same way. So learning has to get to an optimal level, for instance, before sleep can then work to promote what's been learned. Um, a new question that we're about to embark on in, in, in March, we've just fortunately been awarded a nice sum of money from the ESRC for the next four years to investigate some of these questions in autism. And this is something that's really been of real interest to me over the last few years. Um, and autism is very prominently characterised by sleep difficulties. So more than 80% of the, the population have sleep difficulties. And they also have very prominent vocabulary learning difficulties. So we're uh, going to embark on the first set of experiments to see whether these two might be interlinked and whether sleep really should be at the forefront of priority for, for children with, with autism. Within that grant, we'll also be addressing more practical questions like what's the optimal time lag between learning and sleep um, and of course this has consequences for the timing of the school day. Um, so I, I hope I've managed to convince you that sleep is important, that you should go to sleep if, if, you, <laughs> if you're not already aware. Um, and this is really important because children in our country have been estimated, so children between 6 and 15 years, two-thirds of them have been estimated to not be getting the sleep that they should be getting. 74% um, of children aged within that bracket um, get less than the recommended nightly allowance for adults. So it really is important that we raise awareness of sleep and its benefits for learning and memory and health throughout the lifespan um, as an important question for both society and education. Thank you.